Over 50 nautical miles of open sea lay between us and Portland. This was to be our longest voyage and our furthest from land. We carefully reversed off our pontoon at Dartmouth and drifted downstream towards the mouth of the river. The light levels were murky as the sun had not yet made an appearance. The river felt quiet and eerie compared to its daytime bustle. The sun snuck over the eastern horizon silhouetting the Mewstone which lies just off Froward Point. The camera data says that we took the sunrise photos at around 6.20 and at that time we were expectantly looking forward to a glorious day of uninterrupted wall-to-wall -wall sunshine. How wrong we were. The smaller rock to the left of the Mewstone is called the Shagstone, presumably because shags like to hang out there. About an hour after losing sight of the Devon coast behind us, a bank of morning mist drew a veil over the sun's rays and it wasn't too long before it gave up the fight entirely and we found ourselves immersed inside a blanket of thick fog. We switched on the radar and followed the blue line on our GPS and hoped it would clear, which it didn't. Well, not for several slightly nerve-wracking hours. Luckily, there were virtually no other boats out in Lime Bay. We spotted one fishing boat on our AIS display and that was it. At around two in the afternoon, the fog lifted and we finally sighted Portland, six miles to our northwest, which was where we hoped it would be according to our passage planning. What a relief. It was a long day on the ocean, mostly under power as the winds remained stubbornly light and fickle. And we were glad to be alongside that evening for a well-earned hot shower in what have to be the best marina bathrooms ever. The following day, we caught the bus down to the south of the island and explored the bill itself. It's a desolate but beautiful landscape strewn with huge slabs of rock from the days when Portland stone was quarried here and then loaded onto boats. Some of the old machinery is still visible. bus came in handy for grocery shopping and Doris got an outing too. Next to the marina is the old HMS Osprey base which is now a helicopter training school run by Heli Operations. Chesil Beach forms the more exposed western shore leading to Portland. There are miles of pebbles stretching all the way to West Bay in Dorset. It's a great place to look for fossils. Portland's strategic significance was not lost on King Henry VIII. He had the castle built here to guard against the threat posed by potential French and Spanish invaders back in the 16th century. Sadly, the mead jug was just an empty replica. There is a regular bus service to Weymouth, so we took advantage and explored the town with its quaint waterfront. They filmed some of the sequences for the Dunkirk movie here.
He's coming through. To get into Weymouth Town Marina, you have to go through this lift bridge, which was one of the reasons why we chose to stay in Portland Marina instead. The beach has some of the finest sand in the world. I made a mud pie. After a few fun-filled days in and around Portland, we departed for Poole, a short trip of no more than 30 nautical miles along the Dorset coast, although we were a bit too far out to get a proper sight of Lulworth Cove. The way into Poole Harbour is busy with craft of all shapes and sizes. We got a good look at Old Harry, a collection of chalk stacks off Handfast Point marking the beginning of Studland Bay. From the right angle they give the impression of wise old men huddled together discussing an important matter. We dropped anchor a few hundred yards off the south shore of Brownsea Island in the alarmingly named Blood Alley Lake. In fact, we were between Blood Alley and White Ground Lakes. They're not really lakes, but form part of the enormous expanse of water that is Poole Harbour, one of the biggest natural harbours in the world. Few boats ventured past our anchorage during our stay due to the shallowness of the water. In fact, at low tide we completely dried out and were able to inspect the undersides of the hulls, which was when we discovered the fishing net entangled on our port propeller. our brand new prop not very good is it which we think has probably been there since our trip from Foy mm -hmm. uh, no actually uh, f further back probably from uh, Falmouth to Foy because we heard a funny noise didn't we we did on the way yeah so somewhere we picked up a whole bundle of uh, orange, bright orange fishing twine, or fishing net, and uh, we noticed our fuel consumption is a little bit higher than it should be, and uh, that could possibly be the cause. That's all I want to say on that, really. So behind me uh, is Distant Drummer, our beloved catamaran, Nicola waving, and as you can see she has dried out on the mud as they say, although it's not particularly dry, um, and you can never quite tell what sort of angle you're going to get. So she's decided to sit forward, possibly because the anchor chain was a tiny bit short and uh, she's been kind of pulled forward as she dried out so uh, she'll be like that for the next couple of hours until the tide floods back in and refloats her so but it's been very handy 
because we've been able to uh, take a quick look underneath at the propellers and uh, as as we've explained earlier got rid of a whole load of fishing line or fishing net off our port propeller. This is Brownsy Island. This little cluster of buildings here with the canoes on the foreshore is a scout camp but it's not just any old scout camp. This is where Robert Baden Powell in 1907 first began the scouting movement with just a few boys and uh, quite incredible to think that that little scrap of land there on the south side of Brownsey Island has turned into one of the biggest worldwide youth organisations. Um, what else can we talk about here? Well, well it's, a, it's a national trust, um, nationally, uh, National Trust own it and but they sold off uh, Brownsey Castle to uh, well John uh, Lewis lease it have a long lease on it and um, they have turned it into a hotel for their representatives colleagues etc so that's private the actual hotel but the island is owned by the National Trust and we're going to go and visit it tomorrow aren't we? Indeed. Uh, do we mention wildlife yet? No, what we wildlife have, have we seen? We have oyster catchers, which we've seen just wading a few yards away eating razor shells and that kind of thing. Uh, there are shell ducks. Um, a whole range of waders all enjoying the mud here at low tide. In the far distance, Sandbanks, probably some of the most expensive real estate in the world, just juxtaposed next to this natural wildlife area. We went ashore in Betty and explored the island. The stone commemorates the establishment of the first ever scout camp back in 1907. All the places where visiting scouts have come from. A really old tree from 1687. There's nothing left of the village of Maryland. Steve was the only red squirrel we saw. Key. Here is this the drummer. Ooh, all clean and sparkly. Good job, Nicola. Thank you so much. The rest of our horizons. It's a nice marina, much like any other. Lots of motor cruisers, not many yachts. See some really big ones and some smaller ones, and quite a few fishing boats down the end there as well. They will all be going out this morning for their catch. We came in last night about half past eight with the last bit of light, the wind had died down nicely. The marina is right in the town so it's very handy for groceries with a Tesco nearby. It doesn't have much room for facilities so the shower blocks are located just across the road. One day, perhaps. As you can see, they did manage to squeeze in the washing machines. 
Pool Quay is not the cheapest of marinas, but we were only planning on staying a couple of nights. Pool Quay is behind us, that's where our boat is, uh, alongside at the moment, and then if my selfie skills will allow, that's Brownsy Island. Where we were anchored for In the nights. background. And then if I come all the way around, in that direction is Sandbanks, where all the rich people live. Condor Ferries in the background. This bit of water is where flying boats, the short Sunderlands, used to take off from to destinations as far away as Egypt and Singapore. Nicola, what do you think to that? sign says it all and whichever fisherman chucked his net in the water so our propeller got it should have come here shouldn't it Nicola? What do you think about that? <laughs> Pool is home to Sunseeker the luxury yacht builder. It's also home to the headquarters of the RNLI this sculpture remembers some of the crews who lost their lives to save others. We were lucky enough to see them testing one of their new D-Class boats in their indoor wave pool. This is Benjamin Scutt Jr, whose father, also called Benjamin, amassed a fortune from his sugar plantations in Barbados and also trading slaves back in the 1600s. Pool Museum houses some unusual artefacts, including this Dutch figurehead. We hired a car and caught the Sandbanks ferry over to Studland and explored Swanage. We later headed back via the ruins of Corfe Castle. The whole area of Pool Harbour is a great place to explore and we had the best time there. Next up, we sail up the Solent towards the Isle of Wight. Experience an incredible double sunrise. Make homemade beach jewellery. Audition as extras for Poldark and climb the mast. Nice knees. <laughs> 